support me, but only if you wanna. I played a lot of games this year, because that's just what I do now apparently. I'll explain it in the following video for movies and TV, but I fell behind in everything but gaming this year. So this is the biggest list I've got. We're gonna try and hodgepodge this if that's alright with you. This is a ranked list, but it's new and old games. I'll be covering the games I really liked, the games I love, and I'm also going to compile a lot of games into their own little categories that will end up taking a spot instead. You know, because that makes sense. Very rapid fire, but not exactly a YouTube short. Let's get this out of the way. There are some games I did play this year that I never finished. And I'd rather put the games I did finish on my list. Now, out of those games, there's two that were such heavy hitters that I feel you're going to want me to talk about anyway. Baldur's Gate 3, I respect the most out of every CRPG I've ever played. And that's not just me trying to jump on the hype train of everybody else. I'm usually a lot more negative with CRPGs, even though I don't necessarily dislike those games. I don't like the genre very much, so it's just not my type of thing, and it feels like not my type of thing. There's a lot more I liked about Baldur's Gate 3, but it's still, you know, pushing me up against the wall. Which is why I have yet to finish it. I beat Act 1, and that's currently it. Then there's Starfield. And Bethesda RPGs are my type of genre, and I've never been more bored by a game. At least not in quite a while. Now, if you follow my, uh, article work, you'll wonder, but didn't you praise the resource farming? I did, because I do genuinely like how they handle the resource farming. That feels like the most innovative thing they've done for Starfield. But the rest feels like a lot of steps back, and I was beyond bored. I don't care about the story, I don't care about the characters, I don't care about the combat. I kinda like the resource farming, but I don't even like resource farming that much in most other games. I've abandoned Starfield. A lot of me doubts I'll ever go back to it. Okay, now I also have to say, there's a couple games I actually can't rank even though I did beat them. One is Immortals of Avium. And if you're thinking it's because I got nothing to say about it, it's actually because I received that as a code uh, from work. I know I could still talk about it, but I don't know. Feels a little weird to do that. Cooking Mama Cookstar, I did for a video, so if you want my thoughts on Cooking Mama Cookstar, watch that video. Finally, we have Tunic, a little indie darling that uh, I didn't get. And that's what I mean. It feels like I didn't get it. I feel like I missed something. I can't place my feelings on that game. I don't know if I think it's kind of mid. And I don't know if actually it is a masterpiece. I just need to get into the groove of it more. I don't know. I can't rank Tunic because of that. Because I genuinely don't know what I feel about it. But hey, we got a bunch of games I do know how I feel about. Let's get into them. Do we count Ghostwire Tokyo as a 2023 game? I kind of do, and it's a tad underwhelming. The atmosphere is really good, and I honestly liked the Haunted School level missions, but I'm aware that those were added as free DLC for the update to, to you know, the, the Xbox Series version. <laughs> that was the closest bit to a horror experience that I was hoping for. The rest of the game is a bit too generic, and... I don't know, almost feels like it plays a little bit too safe. I like the concept a lot, enough to the point where I would be kind of interested in a sequel that would theoretically rub out a lot of these issues, because I know a lot more people besides me had those issues. The game's kind of mid, and that's a shame considering it looked really great a few years ago. Yeah, who do you, who do, bitch? Dead Island 1 is a terrible game, but somehow... Dead Island 2 was solid! The combat was a lot more fun this time around, and the missions felt a lot more fleshed out, a lot less generic too. Now that said, Dead Island 2 is a lot wackier than Dead Island 1, and I grew to miss how bleak Dead Island 1 is. Dead Island 1 is like the plague dogs of zombie games, and I miss how refreshingly bleak and 
hopeless it was. In a theoretical Dead Island 1, I would want all those gameplay fixes, and I want that stronger mission structure, but I want it to be a miserable experience again in terms of story, because Dead Island 2 is a little bit too cheerful, if that makes any sense. A bit more of the bleakness came through the longer the story went on, but it still never matched how hopeless a situation Dead Island, Dead Island 1 was. And that made it the most unique aspect of that zombie game, so I do hope that comes back. So like I said, some of these entries are categories. And the first category is PlayStation Plus Premium. I finally got a PS5 last year, and it made sense to instantly sign up for PlayStation Plus. And I want premium, because, you know, PS3 streaming, and yet that's a different thing to talk about. <laughs> I get the bad rap PlayStation Plus gets when you compare it to Game Pass, but even the Nintendo Switch Online. That said, I enjoyed my time with PlayStation Plus Premium to the point where I signed back up for it. As for what I played, uh, a lot of licensed games, and that's not a joke. They're guilty pleasures of mine. I had tons of fun helping out Peppa Pig and Hotel Dracula. Unironically, the best of the licensed games I played was My Little Pony Maritime Bay Adventures. I had more fun with that than I did Spider-Man Miles Morales. You can play as a My Little Pony who gets roller skates at one point. Tell me that pony with the zoomies isn't better than Spider-Man. Dare tell me that. I played a couple of, play of PSP games, just two of them, so it was nice. Pinball Heroes is a pinball game. I like pinball, so that's fun. Medieval Resurrection is the more interesting of the two. I do see why Medieval Resurrection isn't the most beloved game, but it's charming. I enjoyed it for what it is. As for the monthly games, we had a clear winner, and that was Dreams. It is a shame that Media Molecule is not going to be updating that game anymore. But please, look up the fan-made games on there now. Because the popularity is gone, only the people dedicated to making their own little fun games are making the games there. I refer to it as PlayStation's Itch.io, <laughs> and I still feel that way. I genuinely wish that the players could charge for these games. They deserve the money more than Media Molecule does right now, considering Media Molecule has just abandoned dreams. You've gone quite mangy, cat. But your grins are comfort. Ravenlock disappointed me at first, the same way that Ghostwire Tokyo did. I expected it to be a horror game, but this one is just more of a dark fantasy. Once I played more of it, it managed to win a lot more of my approval. I like the story and characters a lot. It's full of intrigue, full of tons of fun twists, and the combat is solid enough for what it is. I don't love the way the quests work, because the quests kind of just become fetch quests with checklists. You start one thing, and then it turns out you gotta finish all these other ones. But even that had a bit of a groove to it. I played through Game Pass, which makes it easier to recommend. It's a quirky little indie game. I have grown to really like it. Cat, 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 cat. A castle full of cats is the right kind of game to play on the Switch. It's a hidden object game where the objects are kitties, cursed by a corrupted cat king. It's made by developers who support shelter adoptions and is not subtle about that. But that makes it all the more charming. This is apparently a franchise, and I've already downloaded an arcade full of cats on Steam. So I have high hopes in my quest to find more kitties. Dude, Spongebob Squarepants The Cosmic Shake is kind of exactly the kind of 3D platformer we need more examples of. It may not be as tight as, say, Spyro Reignited, but it's not as far off from that as you might think. Just enough collectibles to be rewarding, and not tedious. Hey, it's got Spongebob and all his friends. It managed to beat the Kitty Cat game in this ranking. You know it's good. I think this is the right spot to put most of my DLC adventures. I found the music tracks added to Sonic Frontiers, and then forgot to do the other DLCs. I replayed the DLCs for The Force Unleashed and Saints Row 4, 
those were pretty fun. Hitman Patient Zero is the best part of Hitman 1. I'm shocked by how much that first part of the World of Assassination trilogy is straight up trash. It didn't even make this list by itself. I also kind of played the Berlin Egg Hunt in Hitman 3 and obsessed over that for a little bit. Now as for a DLC that really stood out, the Indigo Disc tries to be the best part of Pokemon Scarlet, but honestly, I really needed more story and less BP grind. You can read this article for me if you want more, which is technically also true for my positive thoughts on the World Martial Arts Tournament for Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. That's the best add-on, even better than the History of Trunks one, and I kind of wonder if it will be topped by whatever the final DLC turns out to be. I have one more DLC adventure, but that one was so good it earned its own spot, so we'll talk about that later. You now have 15 seconds to comply. Can I just say that I underestimated how good Robocop Rogue City turned out to be? It looked good from the trailers, and like I said, I love licensed games. But Christ, this puts AAA first-person shooters to shame in plenty of ways. I like the story a lot, and I really like how it feels right for the Robocop universe. It's just pure fun and surprisingly strong in terms of gameplay mechanics. There is jank, but the jank is polished. If we're talking full release games that came out last year, this was in my top 5. Granted, I never found the time to play Amend the Adventurer or Super Mario Wonder, and those look like they could have been my number two and one games. Which order you decide. <laughs> I played way too much Disney Dream Life Valley. This world isn't big enough. I've calmed down from Spider-Man 2 now, and I love it less. But I still find it leagues better than Spider-Man 1 and Miles Morales. I'll be real, I never saw this amazing story everyone claimed the first game had. But I do quite like the story of Spider-Man 2. And I especially love all the tweaks to the gameplay. Gadgets feel better, swinging feels better, and they even added a slider that lets the swinging be a lot harder. Like the original Spider-Man 2 in its risk reward system. It's not exactly as great as that one, but I'll take it. You can even turn fall damage back on. I want Peter and Miles to worry about pancaking on the sidewalk. I miss that kind of thing. <sighs> well, and now we get to the obligatory pick. Y'all knew this was coming. Tears of the Kingdom is great. It offers up a lot of what I personally didn't find in Breath of the Wild. It's not clean story-wise as it seems, while with reusing the same Sacred Stone Demon King cutscene four times. I also feel the beginning third of the game is a little bit too hard. However, I also did not actively feel punished for going the wrong way, like I do in so many Go Anywhere games. And once I got into the groove, started leveling up the right aspects of, of Link, I felt like I mastered the difficulty curve instantly. I'm seeing a lot of people coming down from the high now, having more to criticize and thinking it's not perfect after all. But weirdly, I think I like it more now. Now that I've looked at the sizzle, I'm remembering all the fun interactions I had, the genuine creativity I was allowed to have with the thing. And I'm a boring player, I mostly just made hover carts so that way I could fly in the air until they exploded. But even that was a fun and calming experience. Maybe there are things they could have done to really improve it, to turn it into this perfect game that pretty much everyone wanted. But it's still as it is, very masterful for modern open world RPG games. It's a game that I think lessons need to be learned from, and something that I do plan 100%ing sometime even though I know that's daunting. I know there's a lot of bubble gems to get, oh well. Now I doubt anything I said about Tears of the Kingdom was controversial. 
I think this will be controversial. I liked the Teal Mask DLC better than Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah, deal with it. I think the Teal Mask is the better half of the hidden treasure of Area Zero. The Teal Mask just gets its tone completely right. It completely evades the pacing issues that the main game has. Base Pokemon Scarlet does everything wrong that Tears of the Kingdom did right. It's an allegedly go anywhere open world, but you are punished when you do that. The Pokemon are not properly leveled in the wild areas. It feels like you're missing steps and the story can start falling apart. I enjoy some of the story of Pokemon Scarlet like a lot of people do. I enjoy a lot of the characters in Pokemon Scarlet like a lot of people do, but my experience was so shattered because when I wanted to help Arvin, I wanted to help Arvin and then it turns out, no, why'd you want to go help Arvin? You have to do Team Star or a badge now because the next bit is about 20 levels too high for you. And guess what? The Teal Mask doesn't have that problem because it's linear. Believe it or not, sometimes a linear narrative in an open world is not a bad thing. Pokemon Legends Arceus had a pretty linear narrative that still opened up exploration. And yes, there were some areas you could only get if you got the ability later, but you didn't feel locked out from it. It felt like a thing to come back to later. Not a thing where the game went, what are you trying to do here? Who said you can go anywhere? Oh, look at this, even saying I love the Teal Mask, I'm complaining about what is one of the worst games in the series. <laughs> As for the Teal Mask, it introduces Kirin and Carmine. Wonderful takes on some Pokemon archetypes. Something that feels completely fresh even though you see where older games had similar ideas. The map feels really good. Everything's not just called Zone 1 and Zone 2 anymore. They feel unique and different. Sure, there's two apple orchards, but they feel like different apple orchards. I love Oni Mountain a lot, and the story was genuinely intriguing. When I found out there was actually going to continue the story of that in the next DLC, I was so pumped. I genuinely think the Teal Mask is the best part of Pokemon Scarlet, and it's by a long, long, long margin. I cared way more about Kirin and Carmine and Ogre Pond than I did even the main story. It felt so much more fun. It's where I got into shiny hunting and completing the Pokedex. This feels like the kind of innovation that came from Pokemon Legends Arceus. Yeah, it's still linear, like all those old games, but not everything from the old games needs to be thrown in the trash. Stuff like gym badges, that can go, but linear strong narratives that don't fall apart if you do them out of order when you're encouraged to do them out of order that can stay whatever i'm gonna be salty forever but the teal mask is the thing that will convince me to replay pokemon scarlet i don't like the rest of the game but the teal mask was that good which is why i put it higher than tears of the kingdom there was a fearsome demon PlayStation Plus streaming is a thing included with PlayStation Plus Premium, as I said. And I figured, you know what's a good way to test this out? Something not graphically challenging. Let's do the worst part of the Telltale Sam and Max trilogy. Beyond Time and Space, which is season two, has the weakest jokes, and the setups it does to make the story feel grander and the world bigger and more expansive, while not necessarily falling flat on its face, don't really achieve the level that it feels like the game wanted versus say the much funnier season one and the also much funnier but far more also compelling season three. That's why I did it again just to test it. So all I replayed was the first episode. And then a little bit later I was like, well, you know what? Cherry to the Dogs is the best episode. I'll, I'll play that one too. And then I said, fuck it and played all the episodes. I actually had limited time when I did this, and I was supposed to be getting ready for some other games that were coming out. And instead, I replayed the worst Sam and Max season. Not much longer than a year after the time I played the entire worst Sam and Max season over on the Xbox 360 port. I even got all the PlayStation trophies, even though 
I also already had all the achievements. I guess I love this game. Oh my. So speaking of replaying games, I try to avoid putting all-time favorites on these lists. Like, it's just cheating, right? You, you know where they would go. So sorry, Kirby and the Amazing Mirrors Switch Online ports, which in some ways is better than the original Game Boy Advance version because you can rewind if you go through the wrong door. And sorry, Dead Rising 2. And sorry, Halo 3. Now, Halo 3 is where things get a bit interesting, because I think we can count my replay of the Master Chief Collection for this slot. Because while I did replay Halo 3, I also replayed 1, 2, and 4, because I realized I had yet to beat those campaigns on Heroic Difficulty. Oh my god, Heroic Difficulty is fantastic! <laughs> Bungie says that is the difficulty that the games were made to play on, and I know they didn't make 4, I know 343 made 4, but that stays true even for Halo 4. There's just the right amount of enemies at just the right amount of health that you need to knock down that, well, you really have to focus and pay attention to what you're doing. You are always on your toes. And yet, it still feels fair enough that you don't get too angry, that you don't lose focus from your anger. I'm not a hard mode type of guy a lot of the times, but when I make exceptions, it's for games like Halo, where it is hands down the best way to play. If you haven't played the old Halos on Heroic, you're missing the best experience. Shut up and bleed, you motherfucker. Do any of you remember the Twisted Mental TV show? I watched it the entire first season so I could write articles about it. But I didn't know what Twisted Metal was beforehand, so I figured I should do my due diligence. And I watched long plays. I ended up pretty soon understanding why people really liked this franchise. Even just watching it, the personality came through. The fun story and characters and the sort of fighting game mechanical style showed through. But I didn't want to just watch videos. I did buy the PS2 down PS4 port, uh, Twisted Metal Black. And I fell in love with the controls the second my hands were on them. <laughs> I am not a car guy. And I don't just mean a guy who likes cars, I mean, I don't like driving games. I'm usually very bad at them, which is why I thought I would bounce off this stuff. But car combat? That's a thing I didn't know I loved. After I'd gotten PlayStation Plus Premium, the PS1 emulator for Twisted Metal 1 came out. Also 2, but I, I didn't play that one just yet. I stuck with Twisted Metal 1. Twisted Metal 1 is clunky. It is so poorly balanced. You can get stuck on the final level because if you try to use the ramp to get to the next building, you may not have enough speed and there is nothing you can do about it because that is just how the cars work out. And the endings are fucking text over a crunchy PNG that is supposed to be Calypso but kind of just looks like Doug Walker. It was one of the most fun games I played last year in spite of all that. I'm a Twisted Metal fan from now on. This series is great. One, two, three, How the hell did Xbox release Game of the Year at the end of friggin' January? Hi-Fi Rush is a rhythm game you can enjoy even if you lack a good rhythm. A colorful explosion of passion that's funny as hell, yet really emotional when it wants to be. Hi-Fi Rush is the kind of game that completely hides the fact you can customize your character after you beat it. The kind of game that throws everything it can at you while knowing you'll keep up with it. Cry for rebellion in the face of corporatism. A savage punk soul full of guitar riffs and total bops. Everything gels together here into something that may just be kind of perfect. It's the easiest game I can recommend out of everything else that released that year. It started as 2023 Game of the Year, and it ended as 2023 Game of the Year. Franbo's console port was announced eons ago, it feels. But even after the wait, and even with 2023 being stacked with strong horror competition, Franbo comes out and beats everything yet again. Tears of the Kingdom wasn't perfect, 
The Teal Mask, Beyond Time and Space, Twisted Metal, Spider-Man 2, they weren't perfect. Fran Bo, though. As much as it can be completely confusing, as much as the tree people time puzzles require a friggin' walkthrough, fuck man, Fran Bo is one of those perfect little horror experiences. Something video games aren't usually interested in doing. I'll never fully comprehend the story in this game, and that's perfect. A game that knows I don't want every answer. A game that knows cheap death are cheap scares. I'll instantly shrug off. Fran Bo lingers. It demands you care about its main character and fear for her. The horrors that come when you dare to empathize with a bunch of pixels. Why aren't there more horror games as great as Fran Bo? Why can they rarely ever be as great as Fran Bo.